Well, welcome back to the Pomerantz Mentor, sponsored by ProScan Imaging Education Foundation. And today's vignette is going to transition us from FAI to the manifestations of FAI, or femoroacetabular impingement, in the poor, unfortunate labor. Let's get started right away. A little quick review, I think, is in order. Now, normally, if we look at an x-ray of the femur, we have the head, which if we draw a circle around the head, and then we hallucinate the rest of the circle, it is a circle. And the neck is rather graceful. It's tapered, more like a swan's neck, but subtly. And with minor warning, that tapered neck becomes a little bit straight. The sphericity of the femoral head, which we saw in the x-ray, is now beginning to go away. And the neck appears a little broad. This may be one of the earliest manifestations of impingement, especially cam-type impingement. When that transition between the spherical head and the tapered neck is lost. In other words, it's straight or convex outward. We say there's loss of sphericity, and this can create what's known as the pistol grip. Here's a coronal example of the pistol grip deformity versus the normal head and the actual pistol appearance of a small Derringer type gun. The the physis has an extended appearance more laterally and creates this rounded convex outward appearance. With repetitive flexion and in varying degrees of adduction, this component of the non-tapered femoral head-neck junction now rams into the acetabulum anterior wall hyaline cartilage, and fibrocartilage. It produces a small defect that may represent a subcortical cyst, herniation pit, or histologically, an intraosseous ganglia. If something in the back drives the femoral head forward, perhaps the posterior labrum is too long, or perhaps there's a mass in the back, or some other deformity, this antiversion, this anterior driving of the femur creates the same effect. It drives this portion of the femur into the labrum in internal rotation. So this can occur because there's a bump. It can occur because there are abnormal forces pushing it forward or a mixture of both. Here's a more graphic example on CT of a bump. The normal taper transition is lost. There again is our big, broad bump. And what has it done? It has caused shear effects in the superior labrum. The labrum is no longer a well-defined, smooth, corticated structure with a fibrocartilaginous smooth triangle. It has areas of irregularity along its undersurface. It looks a little bit brush border-like. Chondromalacia has ensued. A small bump is present in the coronal projection. And a sagittal demonstrates a longitudinal tear with diffuse swelling. The abnormal signal and loss of hyaline cartilage at the tip is known as a hyaline cartilaginous abrasion. One measurement that's used to assess the character of the bump and the risk for FAI is the alpha angle. An oblique long axis axial is created so that a line along the long axis of the resultant axial oblique from greater trochanter splitting the femoral head is then combined with a line drawn from the center of the spherical femoral head to the transition point between the head and the neck. 
there is some subjectivity to this measurement. On the right, with the presence of a bump, the second measurement now creeps up. We still have our line bisecting the femur, but our second line is now creating a larger angle. It's pointing to the new transition between the head and the neck, which is much higher up and creates an angle that was well under the normal 55 degrees and is now almost approaching 90 degrees, the abnormal alpha angle. You can also create an alpha angle of sorts with a coronal oblique. Similarly, you bisect the femur, and the second line is placed from the center of the femur to what is perceived as the transition or tapered spot between the head and the neck. With a bump, this spot moves up, and the angle once again becomes much larger or wider. This is depicted once more in an axial diagram showing the radiologist's or imager's transition between the head and the neck and the bisection line and the altered angle created by the bump. This perhaps is the easiest one to see. When the patient now internally rotates, the bump is pushed against the labrum and with repetitive internal rotation, shear effects affect the labrum and the underlying hyaline cartilage. So let's take a look at the labrum. There are compressive forces. There are shear or rotatory forces. We can categorize these labral injuries based on their location in cam impingement. In type 1 lesions, there is fibro hyaline detachment. In other words, split or vertical tears occur at the transition between fibro and hyaline cartilage. In type 2 lesions, the tears are a little bit further out, involving the fibro cartilage predominantly in a vertical orientation. In type 3 lesions, the tip of the labrum is truncated or lost the so-called free edge or radial tear. Here's an example of a patient that was using kettlebells for exercise and as a result has amputated the free edge of the labrum and is now replaced by a large collection of blood. The entire labrum from anterior to posterior is now represented by this T1 hyperintense signal abnormality. Perhaps a little bit of labrum remains anteriorly. We can also categorize and describe hyaline cartilaginous injuries. The type 1 hyaline injury, fraying or fibrillation, but very superficial due to compressive forces. The type 2 lesion, oblique or linear or parallel cartilage delamination parallel to the axis of the acetabulum, creating flaps. Type 3, cartilage delamination due to compressive forces that now transgresses the interface between fibro and hyaline cartilage and secondarily involves the fibrocartilage. Then the forces creating a type 4 cartilage problem are depicted here. They're compressive, they're shear, they're rotatory. There are forces that force the hyaline cartilage medially as it tears away from its anchoring structures. Let's take a look. In the type 4 lesion, the fibrocartilage is pushed outward. The hyaline cartilage is pushed inward. They are separated, serrated. The fibrocartilage is coming undone from the acetabulum, and the capsule is beginning to strip away from all. And finally, the fibrocartilage, because of its loss of anchoring, will displace and rotate, in this example, in a counterclockwise fashion. So this concludes our vignette 
on femoral acetabular impingement and its effect on the labrum. We've talked about both fibrocartilaginous effects and hyaline effects and broken them down. You don't have to use the numbers, but do be descriptive. Give a depth, give a length, give a width, give a shape, give the presence or absence of flap formation and signs of potential instability, labral entrapment, fragments, effusions, and rotatory events. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.